Hello and welcome to this special little video celebrating passing 1000 subscribers to my little YouTube channel. Thank you to everyone who has subscribed and stuck with me through this time. I know I'm not the fastest in getting out regular content as my projects tend to take a long time to make, so it really means a lot that you have stuck with me. To commemorate this event, I have in the background been preparing this little side project, a YouTube subscriber counter. But I didn't want to simply grab some pre-made display unit like the many that are already out there. I as always like to go the extra mile which makes things more interesting. At some point last year a couple of friends of mine approached me about a project they were involved with and wanted some of my inputs with me possibly joining the team. While the project didn't go ahead, one aspect of the project really intrigued me, and I saw it as a fun little challenge I wanted to take. The project was to build a working replica of a F-18 Hornet fighter jet's cockpit. With all the displays and functions being programmable, as I believe this was for a film shoot of some description and not a flight simulator. The part that really got me interested was an alphanumeric display. While today it's something we take for granted, it should be noted that this cockpit was designed and built in the 1970s, where LEDs were still a very new invention and only came in at best 3mm domed packages and were not very bright. It should also be noted that these displays were deceptively small. Back in those days it was simply impossible to fit any kind of light source directly into the segments of the display. The digits in the display were less than 1cm square, roughly 7mm. So as an ingenious approach at the time, a cluster of tungsten bulbs were lined up behind the units where the scale wasn't important and fibre optic light pipes were fed into the segments of the display. I knew making a display with LEDs directly in the segments would be possible when making a whole row of the four digit format of the cockpit somewhat simple. But as the project didn't go ahead and I was in the middle of making my retro game handheld at the time so I put this project to the side to do at some point in the future. Then around winter last year my channel started to get more subscribers and I started to look like I might pass 1000 subs before I was expecting to. So I felt I had to come up with a little project to mark this event as 1000 subs is a nice little milestone. Well, maybe a little pretentious as I don't really expect this channel to be anything big, I thought for a bit of fun I could finally get around to making my version of this cockpit display. And I felt what better project to make than a YouTube subscriber counter. Now I wanted my digits to be accurate and when the project was in talks we got involved with the Open Hornet Simpit community. These guys are epically amazing and have put an insane amount of work and effort into getting accurate references of the real world cockpit components and coming up with blueprints and plans to build your own, including plans to build switches and levers that have not been available to buy for many decades. And it was through here I was able to get accurate measurements for the digits of the display, including the space in between each segment. So a massive thank you to them for that. If you're into flight sims and accurate replicas for your sim cockpit, you really should check their site. The link's in the description. I for one, if I had the time and money, would love to build a fully working simulation cockpit, as it's always been one of those dreams I had since a young kid in the 90s, going to the basement of the Trocadero in London and playing at the Battletech Arcade, which ran an early version of Mech Warrior. But you get to sit inside a semi-functional cockpit when you controlled the mech. This definitely sparked an interest in Sims for me. So, hmm, one day, maybe. Anyway, so around the new year I got started designing the digits. Like I already said, I like to go the extra mile. So instead of working on a pre-made cluster with all the control pins being fed out to some LED driver on another board, I wanted to see if it would be possible to make a fully modular digital component with the driver built into the digit itself. With the idea that I could then daisy chain multiple digits, perhaps even in a very long chain but extra reconnection power wires should be considered for long runs, so to take the stress off the power traces of the PCB. For the IC, I first considered the TLC5947 from Texas Instruments. I've used this LED driver plenty of times in many of my other projects. It's easy to work with, but it's a 24 channel driver and I only needed 16. And because this chip is now coming in at around £2.50 each, I felt this would have been a massive waste. 
Texas Instruments also have a 16 channel TLC5940, but I didn't have the best of luck getting these to work in the past, so I felt I didn't want to have to have the headache of trying to figure them out again. But I still had one option, good old reliable shift registers, and in this case the very well known and common HC595. This chip is only an 8-bit shift register, but after a little research I could see that I'll be able to run those 8 bits in a 4x4 matrix to control 16 LEDs, though be it in a 4-row interlace. After looking around on AliExpress, I ended up picking a 595 chip by on Semiconductor. They had three variants of the chip, with one being in the TSOL package and one being in the QFN package. As these were both being sold for pennies, I ordered a bunch of each and got to work designing the PCB. At first, I went with using the QFN package in the design as this was the smallest, but I really struggled to route all the traces to the pins of the chip. I was working in a really small scale. The whole PCB design is only 20mm by 10, with the vast majority of the traces being within that 10mm square in the middle. So I deleted all the traces and swapped the package for the TSOP. While being a slightly larger package, the pin layout with all the board space beneath the package being available to route through made it possible to route the circuit, though be it not the prettiest most graceful of routing. At this scale I really was pushing the limits of PCB design rules, more specifically the rules JLC PCB limit to, not only in the trace width but also the via size. After lots of fiddly routing, I finally managed it, panelled up the digits to maximise JLC's 10cm board size limit and placed an order. This was just at the beginning of the outbreak and lockdowns were soon to hit, so delivery times were a bit on the long side, but this didn't really bother me as this was all just prep work as I knew I wouldn't be needed to work on this project for some time yet. The boards came, as did the 0402 LEDs I ordered, and then the sudden realisation and dread came over me. This was not going to be fun to assemble. 0402 LEDs are really tiny and impossible to tell the polarity of just by looking at them, but I put the project aside for when I needed it. Then my reflow oven video came out and I had a nice good bump of subscribers from it and the very welcome attention from Hackaday. So now the time had come. I first decided on how many digits I was going to have in my display, 15. So then I laser cut the stencil, set up my boards and started placing all the LEDs and resistors on the front of the digits. And this took far 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 too many hours to do. But the LEDs were placed and it was time for them to go in the reflow oven. As soon as the LEDs started reflowing I noticed the problem right away. Many of the LEDs started to tombstone and shift around the board. The problem was my homemade stencil. It might have been fine for bigger components, but at this scale it ended up placing far too much paste on the board and ended up being a bit of a mess. The next day I then spent several hours cleaning up the LEDs, repositioning them with a hot air gun and tweezers and removing as much of the excess solder as I could. But it was done and now it was time to solder the shift wedges and the MOSFETs to the back of the board. Because this was double sided I decided to use my soldering iron to solder the simpler components. If I had used a hot air gun I would have dislodged the LEDs as the boards heated up and I didn't want to spend ages correcting those again. With the boards ready it was time to make the faces of the display. I had a few ideas how I was going to go about this, including 3D printing on the resin printer. It's likely that this would have worked out just fine, but I wanted to come up with a faster way of making these, so I turned to the laser cutter, I ordered some 2mm black perspex and started experimenting. The original plan was to make this in two parts, one with a three hole segment and one with the channel for the LEDs of each segment to fit in. But this ended up looking far too thick for my liking, so I tried out something different. What if I took my segment dots layer and my channel layer and ran them in engrave mode? This way I could run both layers and engrave on the same spot. It will progressively engrave into the perspex. And after about 16 attempts of trial and error with different speeds and laser powers, it worked. This also gave me a much more accurate cut on the dots layer than it did when I was running this in cutting mode. Again, I can only assume due to the scale. The next thing I needed to do was find out the best way to get the lights to diffuse across the three dots of each segment. 
So I tried a few different things, but in the end what I did was take some transparent UV curable printer resin and with a needle plate a drop of resin over each segment and then wipe it up and down with the long edge of the needle. This helped fill up the three dot holes and place some resin on the inside of the channel. This mostly worked but wasn't perfect. I cured the resin and then sanded the faces down flat. And what I had was an unbroken smooth finish. I finished off with some plaster coat to make the faces a uniform matte finish and they looked great, mostly. There was one problem. Because of the inaccuracy of how much resin I put in per drop, just how well each segment diffused was a little variable, but for the most part it came out pretty good. I may one day look into better ways of doing this, but I was happy for now and happy to get on with the rest of the project, writing the software and getting it working. The first plan was to drive the display directly on the ESP8266, while at the same time the ESP getting data off the internet to display. I already came up with a theory of how to drive the display, to use a timer to regularly shift out the data from the current buffer to each interlaced row, and to change what's ever in that buffer whenever I wanted to display something different. But with the ESP8266 this turned out to be next to impossible. I had so many conflicting issues with the ESP, from the majority of the pins being special pins, to not being able to use a timer and a PWM pin at the same time, to not even being able to configure one of the hardware serial outs to send the data. After a week or two of trying to get it working, I gave up on the ESP and decided to use an Arduino to drive the display and have the ESP to gather the data and then send display commands to the Arduino to show on the display. I laser cut some more perspex to make a new frame to hold my display and the new Arduino Pro Mini I'm now using. And it's all worked out really well. So here's what's happening. The ESP gathers data off the internet, in this case UTC time and the subscriber count for my channel, and then formats this data into a string. Using a class I set up on the ESP side, I call a write function that takes the string and formats a packet around it to send over UART. The packet format is a start frame byte, then a command byte, the display data to be sent ended with a new line byte, and then two bytes of a split 16-bit checksum followed by the end frame byte. This then gets sent over UART to the Arduino which then deconstructs the packet, reads the byte command, in this case hex A0 for fixed text display, it then runs an encode function on the string, checking each character and matching it to the 16-bit LED data to place into the interlaced string. The LED data is 16 bits. This dictates what LEDs to turn on for any given character and is organized in 4-bit chunks. The first four bits are for row or cluster A of LEDs, the second four are for B, the third for C and the fourth for D. The code then passes this 16-bit data to the next function. That splits the four chunks and places them into the buffer of their respected interlaced stream. And as the timer is constantly driving the display from this buffer, sending out each interlaced stream one at a time, the data automatically starts showing up on the display. I'm using the SPI hardware of the Arduino to shift out the data at a high speed and thanks to the 500 nanosecond delay between each interlaced data send and image persistence we get a fast updated display with zero flicker. So there we have it, I have a nice little clock and a subscriber counter which I keep powered by USB. But things aren't quite finished there. While this is mostly working, there are still a few bugs I've yet to figure out, and some functions I've not quite completed. One bug that keeps cropping up is that for some reason, in a certain combination of time values, the code that formats the data packet places an extra frame start byte just before the frame end byte of the packet. This creates a checksum or bad header error on my display, this being part of the error checking code I've written. I have no idea why this is happening, but this seems to crop up maybe once or twice an hour. For now, as I need to get on with other things like the Stargate, I'm going to choose another time to fix this issue. So far it seems the issue is purely a problem on the ESP side of the code, with the Arduino control code working as designed, be it not with all the functions I had planned. This includes scrolling text from a larger string length than that of the display, and targeted LED control for running animations over serial. I also only have one driver side animation currently written, and this is just the simple thing I'm using at the startup. 
Now I want to say thank you to everyone, not only those who have subscribed to me, but also to those who have stayed to the end of this video. As to commemorate the passing of 1000 subscribers, not only have I made this counter, but I've also released all the source files and design files, so anyone can make one for themselves. This is not something I normally do. This is free for personal use, so please don't go around selling them, but have fun with them and if you want to improve on the design, by all means, please do so. I have a link to the GitHub page and the Hackaday page for this project in the description. And after being pestered by a few people about it, I have finally opened up a Patreon page for anyone who wishes to help support the channel and my projects. For now this is only offering a basic support tier, but in the future as this channel continues to grow I may also offer higher tiers for access to future design files, so if you want to support me consider checking it out. I also still have the GoFundMe page also in the description if you wanted to just make a one-off donation. If you're not already please consider subscribing as it really helps to grow the channel. As always thank you for watching and in these troubled times take care and stay safe. Bye.